Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this weekend's NBA and college basketball cards. And we'll even throw in a dash of football, if you will. With that, I want to introduce our panelists that we've got on the show today, our guests. First of all, as always, AI Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. And sitting in with us today, a playbook expert that we hold in very high regard, Tony Mejia. And Tony, I want to welcome you to the show for the first time. We're looking forward to working with you from this point forward. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is my my wheelhouse time of year with uh, March Madness approaching and uh, finally done with that debacle of an all-star game. So uh, a final third of the NBA regular season, everybody will care a little more. Unders will come into play a little more and uh, obviously gearing up for the NBA playoffs and uh, spring training started. So looking forward to baseball. So even though football is in the books, still a busy time of year. Yes, it sure is. Yeah, and you mentioned a sore spot, I think, for a lot of people, uh, the debacle being the NBA All-Star Game. And it was kind of an equivalent to the NFL Pro Bowl, if you will. That's what it's turned into. Uh, and I'm sure they have to do something about that here real I've soon. Got, I've got the solution. What's that, Because we, we have all the controversy and the, the disdain for the NBA All-Star Game and the, and the uh, NFL Pro Bowl. What they ought to do is switch sports. Let the NBA players... All stars play football, and let the <laughs> NFL All Pro players play basketball. That might uh, generate you, a great deal of interest in both sports. Probably a lot. Did you see Micah Parsons too. dominate the celebrity game? It was absurd. It, it was like a, a, a man playing with ten year olds. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a real ugly sore spot. Uh, in our daily coffee club, I've kind of hit on that and bashed it a lot here of late, and I can't understand you know why they why they do it other than just for the sake of money, which is exactly what the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball is all about today. And the, they want to keep the fans in tune. They're obviously going to have to make a change. I also want to welcome into the show our producer, Greg De Palma, who does a great job producing our show, he, as he has in years past. Greg, how's everything going for you these days? Going good. This is uh, actually, let me, let me make sure that my screen is run properly. But uh, actually, it's going really good because this is the time of year with the NFL season over that we, uh, or at least I, get really involved with free agency and the NFL draft. So uh, it's a lot of fun. It shows you how the NFL is a year-round business. So I'm uh, I'm really stoked for that. And I'm also stoked for March Madness. You know, I'm, uh, I, 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 my, my, the NBA and I and I think Tony, I know we go back a ways, and I think even back then, I'm sure there's a video of us talking about how the future of the NBA might be in jeopardy with the way things have changed with the rules of one and done or high school to the NBA, and I think that's that's in part happening, and and I and I think that especially with the rule changes and so forth, more offense, no defense, but college basketball to me is still something that I really really love, especially around March and. Uh, I can't wait uh, to start talking college basketball with you guys. Yeah, it's the one sport that I think most fans can relate to, you know, commonly, just given the fact that, uh, you know, there's no ugliness about money, salaries, contracts that we know of, uh, at least. Uh, it's a sport I think we can all relate to, especially March Madness, when there's no better time of the year than watching NCAA basketball tournament time. Yeah, We're going to get know, into Mark? I'm Mark, sorry, I go ahead. Say, I was going to say, Greg was talking about, and you were talking about the show next week, and Greg is talking about preparing for the draft and all that. So maybe we can throw one little thing in there and have Greg start. Where's Justin Fields going to be next year? That seems <laughs> to be the big question of this offseason. I have my thoughts, but I'd like to hear what everybody else says. Tony, what do you think? Where, where's he going to be? Well, I, mean, I, I hear Pittsburgh is interested. If they're ready to move on from Kenny Pickett, I don't know. You know, it's all speculation at this point. But obviously with Fields unfollowing uh, the Bears on Instagram, which is – the way you can tell when a team breaks up with a player or a player breaks up with the team these days, uh, it, it seems like he understands that uh, they're going Caleb Williams and his days there are numbered. Uh, I, I mean, it behooves all parties for them to get a deal done, you know, relatively soon. So we, we may be speculating on that next week, or we may actually have a destination that remains to be seen. But uh, I, I just found it funny. He went on the St. Brown's brothers, uh, a podcast and said, oh, I didn't really mean anything by it. I'm just taking a break from the NFL. But you know, reading between the lines, you can tell that he's he knows he's done there. He'll uh, end up elsewhere. And certainly, I think uh, his best days are ahead of him. I, I, I don't I don't liken it to a 
to a Steve Young situation or uh, you know any other guy that uh, Brett Favre that has had a, a, a rough time at the beginning um, because I, I don't know what his upside is accuracy wise, but it, I think better days are certainly ahead uh, given how awful uh, the Bears' experience was. Well, you know what they say, Tony, you're only as good as the company you keep. And we know Justin Fields is a prime athlete, a premier athlete. He was a high school player of the year, transferred to Ohio State from Georgia, and has played, progressed, I say every year, he's gotten better each year in the National Football League, and I think his best days are yet to come. And uh, I'm sort of with you. I know the, the sentiment is the Pittsburgh Steelers, but Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, did I hear that was it DraftKings or FanDuel has the Atlanta Falcons as the favorite? For the yeah, I heard, I heard that the other, the, the other day or so, and one of the other uh, aspects of this is Kirk Cousins, apparently, uh, they're having some issues. He wants to be in Minnesota, but apparently they're having some issues, and that Kirk Cousins has also been mentioned as a possible uh, player that Atlanta would be interested in as well. You know, so sort of my thoughts on, on Justin Fields is I somehow I think he's going to stay with Chicago. When you think about it, Consider this. They ha they already have a high draft choice for this year. Moving up to number one is nice. It would cost them field. They could probably get Caleb Williams. And I've heard some negative things about the prospects of Caleb Williams at the pro level. And that's, that's the minority opinion. But when I think about the Bears, look at the way their defense improved over the last part of last season. I'll liken it back to about four or five years ago when Tampa Bay, the year before they won the Super Bowl, Tampa Bay's defense excelled over the second half of the season. Now, they ended up getting Tom Brady during the offseason, but that's the year they went on to win the Super Bowl and the defense played at the level that we expected. Now, you look at the Bears. They've already invested three years in Justin Fields, so they already know what he can and can't do, but they've started to surround him with some talent. What I would like to see the Bears do, and I'm not a Bears fan, but I'd say – you know, keep the number one choice or maybe trade down a few spots. But you, first of all, you got the development of a nice running game. Fields gives you that extra dimension with his legs as well as his arm. And you have an opportunity to perhaps get – now, they didn't play together at Ohio State, but arguably Marvin Harrison's the top wide receiver. You surround Fields with those kind of – with that additional athlete, you've got a, a very well-balanced offense to go with what it looks like. And it was, I think it was ever since they, they got the trade for Sweat that the Bears improved over the second half of the season. It's, I think that the NFC North may be the most competitive division next year with what we saw out of Jordan Love, what we know with the Detroit Lions. Minnesota may be the wild card, but the Bears, if they go away from Justin Fields, they're basically starting over, and it'll probably take a couple of years for him, whoever the new quarterback is, Caleb Williams or one of the other quarterbacks. I think Chicago would be making a mistake by trading Justin Fields. I agree 100% with what you just said, Andy. I want to ask Greg his opinion first before I expound on that. What do you think, Greg? Well, Andy brings up, I, I think, the logical approach. Oh, uh, there we go. Like it? Uh, yes, I like it. To, uh, to Fields, because I think that is the way they should go. It just makes too much sense, but that's why they're probably going to do the opposite. <laughs> and they're probably going to give in to Caleb Williams, I'm sure Bears fans. I know there, there is a half and half. Bears fans, somewhat fields, some are, okay, let's move on. But it does make more sense the way Andy said it. I mean, just look where you're at. I mean, the kid has still got talent. And if you surround him with more talent, how do you know he's not going to be capable of uh, another gear? So why, why, you know, it's that, that old adage, the best trades are usually the ones you don't make. And maybe if the Bears don't make a trade, it would be best in their interest. Well, I agree with you. Uh, I think – Part of the reason that he's being bandied about his name as it is, is uh, not so much so much of Caleb Williams, or partly because of Caleb Williams, but I believe he's on the last year of his rookie contract, which means he'll be expensive after this football season here. And the question is, do the Bears want to invest big dollars yep. in Justin Fields or pay a cheaper price with the Caleb Williams and try to sort of groom him, if you will? I think it would be a big mistake to do just that. I'm not a big Caleb Williams fan at all. Uh, I don't like his uh, off the field antics and what he uh, what he's all about. Uh, and I don't think he's he's as rounded of a quarterback as what you need to have to be your leader in the National Football League. Maybe he can throw the ball. He looks like the prototypical type quarterback, but I don't think he's the answer. I really truly don't. If he were, we wouldn't have seen such a collapse from Southern Cal as we did here last year, as opposed to the year before. Yeah, is he uh, mentally tough enough, especially in a big city like Chicago? Exactly. And that's a blue collar town, as we all know. 
uh, I think I'm, I'm with Andy. I think he stays in Chicago here this year, and I think Chicago does the right thing. That's build around him. They've got all this draft capital, all this money, and all these draft choices here. They could really lay the foundation for a real nice football team to build around Justin Fields. That's my opinion personally. Oh, and those quarterbacks uh, that you were talking about, the two cousins and Fields, that is going to dictate a lot, obviously. The Bears, they're that that's – all our eyes are on the Bears. I mean, what are they going to do? When they decide what they're going to do, that is really going to – the domino effect will then take It'll place. It'll dictate the draft, yes. Because you look at it, and besides uh, – Andy, besides you mentioned, of course, Atlanta, you have Minnesota uh, regarding Cousins or Fields. Now, Fields, Minnesota, same division, probably not. But you have Minnesota. Giants may want a quarterback. Washington, Vegas, Denver. So there's a lot of teams that need a quarterback – and you know how it always works out where it it seems that the obvious places, yeah, everybody targets it, the rumors, look at this team. But then all of a sudden, one day we wake up and we see on the ticker, Josh, uh, Justin Fields was traded to it. Where? Really? I didn't think that was going to be the place where he was going to go, but that's more than likely. Raider, Raiders might see. be that place because didn't they just name the offensive coordinator from the Bears as their offensive coordinator under Antonio Pierce? So that might have okay. some legs. There you go. And the Steelers have been on record. Not that it means anything, but basically they said that they're looking for someone who is uh, who is comfortable not being a starter, basically meaning it's Pickett or uh, Mason Rudolph on their roster. Now they could always say, "Well, we re, you know we rethought things if they end up getting Justin Fields," but that's at least the word they're putting out there. But you know, a lot of the stuff that they put out there is to gauge the interest uh, from teams, and you know, it may very well be that the Bears are just looking to see how valuable that number one draft choice is. Sure. And it's smoke, it's smoke screen time. And, exactly. and, and now we'll get uh, the combine next week. So even more gossip than news. Uh, you know, you, you'll probably hear some about Drake May potentially yeah. moving into that number one spot because because there are people uh, being detractors yeah. to uh, to Williams over the past See, I mean, I, I think he is a, a phenomenal talent. I don't put this past season on him because the offensive line was garbage and uh, and that defense was obviously what it was uh, in terms of terrible. Uh, but, you know, Williams, Drake May, we've got Daniels. Uh, Michael Penix is, uh, is a personal favorite of mine. Oh, if he can stay healthy. So uh, it's going to be a great draft class. And then you add that in the mix with, uh, as Greg said, all these teams looking for quarterbacks. Uh, we should we should get a fun um, you know uh, training camp for all these people after the draft. And woven in there somewhere is Marvin Harrison, the wide receiver from Ohio yep. State, who might end up being the most talented player in the draft. Arguably, we don't know, but uh, you know the question is, will he end up in Chicago with Justin Fields? That could be a possibility as well. And if it, that happens, uh, that's quite a nice little tandem there in Chicago to begin the 2024 football season. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We're visiting with Tony Mejia, a playbook expert, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, and our good friend Greg DePalma, the producer of the show. And as I mentioned, next week on the show, we're going to be presenting our best and worst of the 2023 college and pro football seasons here. Uh, we're going to hit on all sorts of kind of topics and subjects. Uh, some of the things like the best thing we saw in the 2023 season, uh, the worst thing that we saw in the 2023 season. That might be simple, easy enough. All you have to do is ask yourself, how many times did you watch the Iowa offense play throughout the course of the 2023 football season? That's probably the lock answer. I the recorded worst their games, and every time I have trouble falling asleep at night, it goes right <laughs> on the screen. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, we'll be doing that in both the college and the pro football side of things. And uh, we're also going to talk about next week about some of the major injuries that occurred in the National Football League this year. And there were a bevy of them, a lot of them, and how meaningful they were to a lot of players. Uh, our friends at rlads.com put a great report together. Greg and I work with our lads and do some work for them as well. So we'll share a lot of that information with you. If you're watching the show, we encourage you to hit the like button, or if you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button as well. And we'll keep you informed on all of our future podcasts here on Mark Lawrence against the spread. With that, let's move on over to what will be the basketball scene this weekend. And Tony, let me ask you, first of all, before we get into some complimentary plays on the football scene, uh, you mentioned about the NBA All-Star Game uh, being what it is. I mean, the teams are back right now. 
uh, for the, what would be called the second half of the basketball season. Any thoughts you have moving into the second half of the NBA basketball season that you might warrant seeing a surprise team or two? Well, I mean, look, the Western Conference is tightly packed. There are teams at the top that few expected to see. You have the Timberwolves as the number one seed. They're the one team that has played defense all season. By all defensive metrics, they've been the top defensive team. Rudy Gobert is going to be a defensive player of the year this season. Uh, I, I wrote a, a, a awards column for Sporting News, and there are still so many things that are up for grabs that you can bet on from a future standpoint. Uh, you don't want to bet on, on Rudy Gobert because uh, you're laying minus 600 at this point. It's uh, it, So long as he hits the 65-game threshold, it is a lock that he will be the defensive player of the year. But Carl Anthony Towns has been able to become a much better defensive player around him. Anthony Edwards, was, his tremendous athleticism on the perimeter has been great. Uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, an, an excellent defender. Mike Conley, despite his age, also solid on the perimeter. And um, that's why Chris Finch is going to get some Coach of the Year love because he, he's been pushing the right buttons. So you got the Timberwolves at the top. You've got the Thunder uh, beating the Clippers to, to start off uh, the, uh, the final third of the season on Thursday night uh, in resounding fashion. They beat them at home, and that was a, a very low number because there's a lot of people that think the Clippers are going to come out of the uh, West so long as Kawhi Leonard and James Harden stay healthy with Paul George. Uh, and uh, so that was a showdown last night, and the Thunder crushed them. Uh, tight game early, and then in the second half, it was all OKC. Shea Gilgis Alexander is a top three M MVP candidate at this point. Um, a lot of people, unless you're a big NBA head, really haven't gotten a great look at him. I mean, that's a 30 point scorer in the NBA, and he and he does play both sides because he blocks shots uh, similar to how Dwayne Wade used to, and 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 uh, averages over two steals a game. So legitimate MVP candidate. Uh, and then you've got at the bottom end of the Western Conference spectrum. The teams that you did expect to see, the Warriors and the Lakers, who met last night. Um, you, you've got uh, uh, other top contenders. Uh, so it's it's a deep top seven, top eight. Uh, the Dallas Mavericks sent a message uh, you know, with their victory, uh, really uh, getting both Luka Doncic and uh, Kyrie Irving to coexist extremely well. They they either scored or assisted on a hundred points last night uh, in, in their victory. Uh, so this is a, a deep Western conference and in the East it, it's at this point, the Celtics invitational, but <laughs> does Joel Embiid get back, uh, for the final few games to make the 76ers interesting. You've got teams like the Knicks and Cavaliers who haven't been there in a while, um, really taking steps forward. We'll see if Julius Randle is able to come back from New York that, that would uh, make them a, a definite contender. So uh, a lot of good storylines. You know, it left a, a bad taste in everybody's mouth, the All-Star game. And uh, I think they, they need to bring back the Elam ending for, for one. I thought that was a, a, an exciting tweak um, to, to at least have guys play uh, competitive basketball at the end of games. You could also separate it by quarters uh, the way they did at one point and, uh, and donate the proceeds to charity. So they're playing every quarter competitively. So I think uh, certainly Adam Silver is going to have to go back to the drawing board on what we saw on Sunday night. But looking forward to the second half of the season and uh, and certainly the playoffs because those will be competitive. Uh, Andy, let me ask you this. Tony mentioned uh, MVP uh, last year, Jokic, uh, Denver, the Joker. Uh, and what do you, what do you see from Denver the second half of this basketball season? I think they're I think they finished up in fourth place, uh, the number four seed going into the All Star break. Uh, one of the good interesting things I read about Jokic uh, was that he owns a lot of horses. He loves horse racing. He has a horse racing farm in Serbia and uh, kind of near and dear to me because I also love horse racing and uh, kind of drew me a little bit closer to him. But uh, what do you see from the Denver Nuggets happening in the second half of this season, Andy? Well, as the defending champions, and you know, I, I can also put it with a couple of the other teams that have had a little bit more experience in the playoffs in recent years, like Golden State and Milwaukee come to mind. Is I mean, all the extra games that some of these teams play over the course of a playoff season? You know, you got four series. You could be playing, you know, 20, uh, 25 games possibly. That's almost a uh, you know a third of a season that a lot of these teams will have played, and that takes a lot of toll of you, especially when you're running up into 
down the court, putting all the pressure on your knees and on your feet, etc. So uh, teams like Golden State, Milwaukee, to a lesser extent Denver, although they don't have quite the amount of experience, they just work their way through the regular season. The goal is to make it into the playoffs, and those teams like the Bucks, Warriors, and now the Nuggets know that they can win it. As, uh, you know, The key is to be as injury-free as possible, but also to be as fresh as possible when the, uh, uh, when the playoffs begin in a, another uh, month and a half or so back in the, I think, the middle of, of, of April. Uh, I like what I see out of this Denver team. The team that, that really has impressed me, and Tony talked about them, actually two of them, but I've especially uh, been impressed with Minnesota uh, really since the start of the season. I actually made a futures bet on uh, Anthony Edwards, an MVP bet. He probably won't win it this year because of the other guys who are more well-known and have had you know, more uh, experience being uh, at the top, if not winning the MVP outright. But I like the look of this Minnesota team. Uh, Oklahoma City again. The Clippers have as much talent as uh, as any team with Kawhi Leonard uh, and uh, uh, George when they're both healthy and playing. A little suspect about the coaching. I heard uh, uh, some commentators who were evaluating the uh, coach of the year talking about Tyron Lue. Well, you know he's 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 finally getting out of this team what this team has not been able to give the last few years. But let's see what happens. Uh, I don't know how well the uh, Doc Rivers uh, situation is working out in Milwaukee. It uh, a little bit of a surprise when the coaching change was made, but it hasn't had a positive effect. The Bucks continue to not play well. Another team in the East that uh, has been playing extremely well, and certainly from a point spread as well as an on the court, the Orlando Magic. They proved it again last week, uh, last night rather, Thursday night, with a with a nice uh, win to open the uh, the figurative second half of the season. It's really the final third of the season. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's wide open, uh, certainly in the West, where you can make a case for any number of teams. Tony mentioned Dallas. There's another team that. Uh, as an MVP caliber uh, player in Doncic. So uh, the, the East, you'd have to think Boston is going to be the number one seed. They've already got, what, a seven-game cushion over Cleveland. It's going to be interesting to see who rounds out the top four because you've got a number of teams. We've got, of course, the Knicks and the 76ers dealing with key injuries uh, for uh, for each team. Indiana, uh, Halliburton, and they had the nice uh, Siakam uh, addition. So they may have some uh, something to say. Everyone wants to avoid that uh, – seven, eight, nine, ten uh, uh, play-in games if possible. But sometimes that also gives teams a little bit of momentum. But uh, I, think it's, it's, I think it's much more wide open in the West right now than it, in, it is in the East. But I would still not rule out any of the uh, four or five contenders in the East below Boston to make a deep run. And, Greg, what do you think uh, we see in the second half or, as Andy says, the figurative second half of the NBA basketball season? Any team or teams that you might pick as a surprise coming home? Actually, um, I'm sticking to uh, my college game uh, this season. Uh, I've been really diving into college uh, basketball, so I'm not going to be – I'm not going to try to fake being an expert like these guys in the NBA this season. Like I said, I mean, I'm one of those fans that – I really, and I don't think the All Star Game has anything to do with it. I just think, to me, I just think that's a cop out. I, I think it's the game itself. I think, uh, I think the rules need to be tighter for uh, better defense. I, I'm not saying let's go back to the days of '85, '84. I'm not saying that. Um, and I also think that there's got to be uh, just an overall way. And I know this is something that people talk about, and that is uh, players missing 10 or 15 games a season and should they be forced to play a certain amount of games remember the and i know i don't want to sound like an old guy but remember the days go when, easy there greg go uh, easy please i know remember the <laughs> days when i think there was a situation <laughs> when david stern um i heard this on on on, on a show that he uh find the lakers uh in a game at the last game of the season a meaningless game because Riley was going to sit uh, Jabbar and Magic and so forth, and he fined him like, or was going to find him like a hundred thousand dollars or something. I mean, just just think of where that was and where we are today, where just resting guys is the norm, and the guys today are making a hundred times more money than the guys from twenty years ago. So, I think there's a way to stop that, and I also think it's important that the league. Um, try to do something. And I know it's hard because they let the cat out of the bag with just coming to the NBA as quick as you can from college. I just wish there was a way to make these kids a little bit more co- uh, pro ready because as you know, Tony, and again, I, I, I talked basketball with you quite a bit back in the day. Um, 
pro coaches, man, they don't want to they don't want to teach the kids fundamentals. I mean, this is the NBA, man. You got to be ready. I don't want I don't have time to teach you fundamentals. We have to practice. We have to get ready for team X or team B. I don't have time to teach you stuff that you should have learned in college. Well, guys, I'll throw my two cents in here about uh, the second half of the NBA basketball season. It goes back to an old axiom that I followed, I think, since I can remember watching Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and the likes back in the day. And the truth of the matter is you'll find that the teams that end up the season that are ranked in the top five or ten on offense and the top ten or five on defense are the teams that make the playoffs. Never changes. Never changes. And you can score all the points you want, but you still have to be able to play defense if you want to cut down the net. So uh, if you're watching the teams moving forward there, focus in on those teams, the teams that rank in the top five or ten offensively and defensively. Maybe you'll find a sleeper or two in there. Maybe you can make yourself an extra couple of bucks on a futures on a bet like that. But that's my thought, my closing thought at least. And picking a winner in the NBA to make the NBA basketball playoffs. By the way, season. I don't want to sound like the uh, the old curmudgeon guy, but uh, you guys have to have something that you would like to see the NBA do better of yourself. So why don't you, Tony? What do you want? What do you think the NBA could do better to to market the sport to to just be a better league? Uh, for the fans, because again, you, you you just can't deny that the the ratings are not where they were ten or fifteen years ago. They they they're on the way up. Look, I think the league is in good hands. It's certainly younger, but we 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 see LeBron still dominating at thirty nine years old. We see Steph Curry doing what he's doing at thirty five. Kevin Durant, same thing, thirty five. Those guys are obviously uh, anomalies, but they are they remain. Uh, household names and, and guys that, uh, that people tune in and they'll be gone soon or on ABC every night. So the, the one thing that, that has, has improved. Uh, and I, I was watching the, the Indiana glory NBA TV special. They did. They had Reggie Miller kind of emceeing talking to, uh, to Larry bird and Isaiah Thomas about, you know, basketball in the Hoosier state and, and, you know, the rivalries in the eighties, even Larry bird, who was so skilled, he would have a hard time, or not, not not a hard time, but he would be on the same level at at as some of these guys now. I don't know if it's because of practice habits or just because of the the, the evolution of the game, and certainly some rules changes. Um, there there are so many open looks in an NBA game, and the pace is so fast that that's why we've seen totals go from two ten being considered high back in the day to that being one of the lowest totals on the board. Uh, where, where you fully expect, I mean, if you hold a team under 100, <laughs> which the Timberwolves has actually done regularly, and that's that's why uh, they're kind of a throwback, uh, that's that's saying something. That's, uh, you know, a, a grand accomplishment. And now you see teams in, like the Pacers. I, I was on the Pacers and Pistons over 246. They got to 244 last night. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you said, oh, well, the, Pistons, the, the Pacers had an off night. They scored 129. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it just is the way the game is played. Uh, Rick Carlisle, who was on those great Celtics teams and has been through this evolution of the game uh, as a coach uh, for now 20 years, um, he preaches pushing the ball down the floor as quickly as possible. Two dribbles and the ball is up. It's just the way the, the game is played. Maybe it's not aesthetically pleasing to some. There's some people that don't want like the college game at all. Uh, I watch both. I love both. Um, but it, it, it is a different world. Um, I, I think you can't go back to the hand checking rules. I think it would just be too much of um, something that these kids have not been used to. Uh, I, I do think there there are certain things that that can be done from the standpoint of potentially uh, light, lengthening the three point line to uh, to maybe twenty four and a half feet. Uh, which w it would be a little longer, uh, but I think the, the analytics folks would balk at that. So I, I think we're seeing th what we're seeing, and hopefully the playoffs end up being the savior for the NBA uh, because, again, th those games, they tend to be great and tend to be wonderfully competitive with guys whose skill level is on another level. And, and, and like, college basketball has even had some – issues uh, you know i can't handicap early college basketball anymore the way i used to because of the roster turnover everybody's hitting the transfer portal yep. and you've got six seven eight guys coming in you have you, you have to trust coaches to get these guys together and all of a sudden in december january 
teams that have languished in November are, are, are much better because the pieces now fit. So it's just a completely different game on the hardwood at both ends. That was Tony Mejia joining us from playbookexperts.com with his observations on the NBA basketball card. It's becoming an up-and-down game in the NBA these days for sure. Let's switch it over to the college basketball side of things, guys, if we may, and uh, talk a little bit about the 2023-24 season to date. And more specifically, because it is that time of the year, the teams that are sitting on the bubble, that's a big popular word in college basketball these days with March Madness, and teams that are sitting on the bubble. Andy, how do you see anybody sitting on the possible bubble in the NCAA basketball world these days? You know, I, it's about this time that I really start putting together my list of uh, where I think these teams are going to be going as far as the brackets are concerned. I haven't quite done it yet. I usually wait till about a week or so remaining in the uh, before before the start of the uh, conference tournaments, and we're at about that point. You take a look at a lot of the teams, for example, in the Mountain West, where some people say as many as six or perhaps five will make the tournament. I don't think it'll be quite that high. It might be three or four. And right now, everybody is bunched at the top of that division with, I think, three or four losses at a minimum at the top of that conference. Uh, look at the Big Ten with a lot of teams that uh, uh, you would think should be in. A team like the, is playing extremely well right now that I don't know that they're considered a, a bubble team, but Michigan State, which struggled so much in the early season, a lot due to, due to the transfer portal has gotten things together as Tom Izzo teams normally do, and they could make a run and they might be a nice little play to perhaps uh, win the big 10 uh, conference tournament uh, in another three weeks. So uh, when I look at bubble teams, uh, it, it, you almost have to focus basically on the, uh, the power conferences. You don't see that many of those mid major teams with uh, the exception of teams that have some upsets uh, against a uh, top seed team, you know, maybe like a Drake and an Indiana state can both make it from the uh, Missouri uh, Valley. Uh, I, 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 w one of the best games played Thursday night that nobody paid attention to, uh, but I was keying on, was Grand Canyon and Tarleton State in the WAC, the top two teams. And uh, both of those teams, one of them probably will get left out. The other might be a bubble team only because they're having outstanding seasons, but the competition has not been great. But both of those teams have uh, played outstanding basketball throughout the season. I think right now we're at 68. I would not be surprised to see uh, further expansion. You know, Greg, by the way, asked one thing about uh, the NBA this year. What Adam Silver has done, he's been very progressive compared to what David Stern has done. The in-season tournament is a perfect example. The players were reluctant at first, but now they've embraced it. And that is the kind of forward thinking that uh, uh, that, that we can look for in the NBA going forward. I like I like what Adam Silver has done. Getting back to the uh, bubble team. So, uh, you know, maybe it's hard to say because you could... what we've seen this year, we've, we've seen so much inconsistency. This is the first year in quite a number of years that I can recall where we don't really have a clear-cut likely Final Four teams or even teams to win the championship. We don't have any teams right now with like two losses or maybe, well, I think Connecticut got their third loss the other night, that you can say uh, these are the teams that should be able to uh, uh, to make it to the Final Four as favorites right now. And that has sort of, uh, you know, drilled down into the mid to lower level of conferences where you look at a given week, a team can be six in the, con in, in the conference and all of a sudden out, and then they're on the bubble because they're up to third the following week. And Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas with his observation on what's going on in the NBA and college basketball teams that are possibly sitting on the bubble and talking about teams sitting on the bubble. Once again, in our coffee club that I shared with our listeners and our subscribers, we hit on that just a little bit, and uh, there's one team that I will not rule out, and a lot of it has to do with the coaching, and I think a lot of where these teams get to or go to are largely because of their head coach. And looking at teams that are on the bubble, the first thing you want to look at, at least I do, are whether these coaches have been there and done that before. Uh, and those that have are the coaches that obviously know how to get there, how to accept or get themselves an invitation to the big dance. And one team that uh, I'm going to mention here that uh, cost me dearly, they had a horrible loss uh, early, I think it was Sunday maybe, uh, was St. John's uh, in their basketball game uh, when they just they blew a 19-point lead and uh, got smoked at the end of the basketball game. And Rick Pitino went off on this team here in a big-time way. It was sort of a Lou Holtz-esque type lashing, tongue lashing that he gave his basketball team. 
but they're still a team that I feel has to be considered on the NCAA basketball bubble that I would consider if you're betting uh, futures or not futures, but teams that will emerge from my proposed list of bubble teams. I think DraftKings has a list of 10 or 12 teams that are on the bubble and you can bet on which ones will make the tournament. And I, my suggestion was I would look at St. John's here real close because of Rick Pitino. He's been there. He's done that. He's got what I call a Pinocchio size nose for finding ways in to make himself into the NCAA basketball tournament. And I think uh, it's tightening the screws like he did against that program when he, when he was red faced embarrassed for that loss here, I'm going to look for better things to happen from St. John's moving on. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We're being brought to you by our friends at uwager.lv, where they feature monthly 5% rebates, free same day payouts. You can check it out online at uwager.lv or give them a call toll free to take advantage of all the extra bonuses at 1 800 UWager. And with that, guys, uh, let's head home, if we will, here and share with our listeners out there some thoughts about maybe a complimentary play that you might be looking at on this weekend's college or pro basketball card. And we'll start out with you, Tony. Any particular game that catches your fancy this weekend? Yeah, I mean, we're talking bubble battles and and teams that have fallen below expectations. The preseason number one was uh, Kansas. And uh, they looked like a super team because they got the top transfer in the portal and Hunter Dickinson from Michigan. We've seen how the Wolverines have fallen apart without him. Uh, and he's actually come to play. He'll probably be a first or second team All-American. But unfortunately for Bill Self, some guys that he expected to provide depth have really fallen uh, through. So he's playing guys 35, 37 minutes a night. They've already suffered six losses again as of the preseason number one. Like it was a big story when they lost to Marquette out in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, since then, things haven't gotten better. They lost to my alma mater, UCF in Orlando, which is ridiculous because the Knights uh, aren't built to compete in the Big 12 just yet. And yet they were able to catch Kansas on an off night. Uh, and that's really that really tells you what this college basketball season has been all about. Uh, but to get to the point, they're at Allen Fieldhouse, where they are 13-0 and this season, playing Texas, who is far, squarely on the bubble. If you look at the bracket matrix, uh, they are a nine seed at this point, but they've got really tough games ahead. Uh, they'll be a team that's sweating out selection Sunday unless they can get one of these road games against a Kansas or against a Baylor uh, and against the Texas Tech, who will make the tournament. Uh, Grant McCaslin's done a great job there in his first season after moving over from North Texas. But the, the point is, is the Longhorns play the Jayhawks in, at, at 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow in a game that that really will uh, come into play on Selection Sunday. The Jayhawks, uh, Bill Self has said, we have to take care of, of home court at this point. We just need to get to the tournament healthy. And uh, unfortunately for them, they've got their best two-way player, Kevin McCuller, uh, Tweaked the knee uh, over the weekend in his in his first game back after a couple of game absence. They were able to hold on against Oklahoma, and he played 35 minutes in spite of the knee issue, but hasn't practiced all week. Self won't divulge if he's going to play tomorrow. I think he's going to get at least 20, 25 minutes. Uh, but that, that's a game where you have to monitor uh, your X or whatever you use to – get your instant news. That's, that's what I use. I'm constantly refreshing beat writers and, uh, and looking to see what the, the latest information is uh, regarding player absences and injuries. Do that NBA as well. Uh, and, and so Texas, uh, Max Asmus, the, the kid who uh, was a tournament darling at Oral Roberts a few years ago, joined the 3,000 point club, 12th player to do that. Over the uh, on uh, on Big Monday, you know, and when they desperately needed over Kansas State, uh, so you got two desperate teams. You've got a potentially uh, injured player going out there for 20 minutes or being absent. Uh, that screams under to me. That screams a possession by possession game coming down the stretch. I know the Bart Torvik site uh, projected the spread to be Kansas minus six six and a half. If uh, if McCollum isn't in the in the mix, uh, it, it probably dips to five or four and a half. Um, they were able to get a huge victory because he was scratched, uh, if you remember, a few a few, a few weeks back um, when the injury popped up against Baylor, and they were able to still hold off Baylor. That was one of the, the great wins, a, a testament to Bill Self and still being one of the best in the game. But, yeah, that's my call tomorrow. Kansas, Texas going under the posted total. 
Tony Mejia goes under in the Kansas-Texas Big 12 showdown basketball game for his complimentary play on the show this week. And you can check out all of Tony's selections at playbooksports.com. You can also do a shortcut to get to Tony Mejia's selections. Simply type in this address, tm.pb.buzz, tm.pb. Dot B-U-Z-Z. That's a shortcut to Tony's selections and what he has to offer each and every day. Check it out online to get to Tony's playbook expert selections this week. Andy Isco, what grabs your attention this week? Well, I'm going to go with a chalky play tomorrow. They don't always lose. Uh, they uh, do come in in certain situations, and I like the game between Villanova and uh, UConn. UConn coming off only its third loss of the season, and it was an ugly loss. So what was it? I think 85 to 66 or something along those lines. The most points that uh, Connecticut had given up, I think, not all season, but in quite some time, and also – uh, the first time in, uh, oh, I think about eight or nine games that they allowed under 70 points. Uh, I love the coach, Hurley. He's, you know, great uh, uh, line of coaching. His father and his brother now, of course, doing well, um, you know, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, leading the team. They won the national championship last year, uh, largely on a, a late run that they had. And uh, I expect them to respond well against the Villanova team that they struggled to beat the first time they met down in Philadelphia. They beat them by one point. So they'll have their attention. Villanova's won three in a row. Uh, UConn has a lot of double digits. They're unbeaten at home. Uh, most of those uh, those wins have been by double digits. And I think the line's going to come out around, uh, I'm going to say somewhere between nine and a half and ten and a half in this game. Probably around ten would be the number. And I'm going to look for an explosive effort against uh, a Villanova team. Now, the one concern I have, but it may not apply here, Villanova leads the nation, 82% free throws. Now, I like to use that number when I'm looking to back a favorite of that uh, like six points or less because if fouling comes into play late in the game, they're going to go to the line, you know, and they're going to get the two points that the opposition was hoping to have them not get. Uh, but when you're, when you're trailing, as I expect Villanova to do, that, that strategy won't come into play. Connecticut's in the 70-something percent range, so they're decent if they go to the line. But I don't think it's going to come down to a fouling situation. I think uh, Connecticut wins this one. Probably I've got uh, somewhere from 14 to 17 points. And he's got Connecticut winning comfortably against the Villanova, Villanova basketball team. And, Andy, odd you mentioned that about Villanova and being so good from the charity stripe. I can go back to days when Jay Wright, as long as he was with the program, they always ranked in the top five in free throw shooting. I don't know what it is about the program. Maybe it was Jay Wright that kept the players there and they couldn't leave uh, after practice until they can 10 in a row. I don't know what it was or what it is, but Villanova is indeed a very, very good team from the charity stripe. Greg De Palma, basketball college is your forte. What catches your fancy this week? Yeah, well, uh, no surprise, I'm a futures guy, and especially I love it in college basketball at this time of year. Uh, you talking about that future, Mark, with um, that you can uh, take advantage of at DraftKings. Just so you know, St. John's 3-1 to one, making the tournament uh, regarding those bubble teams. And um, a couple of that actually, uh, actually there was one or two that caught my eye. One was uh, Ole Miss, Chris Beard's team. Uh, they're 2-1 to one to make it. So that's the one that I, I really would, would probably pick um, more than any other because, you know, you're getting decent numbers. And uh, I saw Drake on there at plus 165. I certainly hope it doesn't come down to that because they proved last year they were such a tough team. Matter of fact, you and I talked about Drake on yes. our shows last year. Then they get to the tournament. They have Miami right where they want them, and they blow the late lead. And Miami goes all the way uh, to, to the Final Four. But that just shows you, I know Drake doesn't have the same team, but they still have the star player, the coach's son. They did beat Nevada this year. They're t you know, they didn't have a lot of tough opponents, but I think that's a team that still uh, could be a team you want to keep an eye on as far as those futures are concerned. And then you were talking about Michigan State. You know what? I think this is when Tom Izzo's teams are the most dangerous. Uh, he'll find a way to get to the tournament. Uh, they're 55-1 to 1 to win the national championship. Wow. So I think Michigan State's a really good, pro uh, good play. As far as a big number, um, and then as far as other numbers, Creighton off the big win against UConn, thirty to one, to win the national championship. They have three players currently over seventeen points per game. This could be Greg McDermott's best team, so keep an eye on Creighton. And another bubble team to keep an eye on might be Seton Hall and Shaheem Holloway. Uh, that's a team that 
Uh, of course, that's a coach. We all know what he's capable of. But Seton Hall is a team that has really come on in the second half of the season compared to early on in the first. So those are a few uh, futures that I, I would keep an eye on. And by the way, I know Jim uh, Feist hasn't been feeling well. That's the reason why he wasn't on the show, Mark. But Jim and I had we were this close to, 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 to put some uh, college basketball videos together. Uh, and so uh, we'll... We'll be doing that real soon. So keep an eye Good. on this channel. Keep an eye on my channel, Prime Sports Network, because we're going to start talking. And by the way, of course, Tony is also going to be doing a lot of uh, videos as well on a daily basis, you know, college basketball, NBA. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're getting uh, really involved, especially for me in the college hoops game real soon. Well, real one good. thing I want to comment, uh, Greg, on your talk about Mississippi. I agree with you about Mississippi. I, the... It, we see it with every sport. Almost as soon as one season ends, the futures for the following year come out. Keep an eye on maybe getting in early on Ole Miss to uh, to win or and or make the tournament next year. I think they're going to be a they'll be a decently priced team because you know if they make the tournament this year with the limited experience that Beard has with this team, although he's brought it around nicely. You know this is only his first year at Ole Miss. Now he knows the league. Now he knows his players, and he's been a good recruiter, and he's always emphasized defense. Mississippi might be a team. If you're looking for a legitimate chance for a long shot in what has, over the last few years, especially with Kentucky uh, not being at the uh, level that it's been for many years, it's been a very competitive SEC conference. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Ole Miss get a lot of pub earlier at the start of next season, but if you get a chance to get some decent odds on them, which you should, uh, when the odds come out probably right after the championship game this year. Let me also jump on Greg's bandwagon there. He mentioned uh, Michigan State, uh, 55 to 1, uh, a nice healthy price to win the NCAA basketball tournament. And it's not out, as outlandish as it sounds. If you looked at the beginning of the season, the AP top 25 preseason teams, they were a, tenth, a number 10 ranked team was Michigan State to begin the basketball season. And this is indeed Tom Izzo's time. We call this out in the weekly Playbook Basketball Newsletter. And from game 20 on out, when Tom Izzo's Michigan State Spartans basketball team is playing with revenge against an opponent, they just simply dominate. They'll be in that role Sunday, by the way, against Ohio State. So take a look at Michigan State when they play Ohio State on Sunday. Greg, was that your final thought or would you have a complimentary player? Is that what you needed, wanted to say? You know, I also want to bring up a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, teams. Gonzaga, they're officially a bubble team, believe it or yeah. not. Uh, so keep an eye on that. And what about the job Amir Abdul-Rahim has done at South Florida? I mean, especially they just blew out FAU. Uh, that's a team, and we knew what FAU did last year, of course, going all the way to the Final Four. So keep an eye on South Florida. I know they're probably going to be a chic pick once the brackets are out. But this is the time to kind of keep an eye on them, maybe before the brackets come out and everybody starts. Because they've already beaten what, what are What are they to make the uh... – to the tournament or the final four. Have you yeah, that? They, I didn't have those odds. I don't know, but I would like to know that. Yeah, I, I'm going to take a look at those for sure. They were they were heavily favored to uh, to win the American. I know that because I wrote a, a, a column looking at all the mid majors, uh, and and once they posted that win, their road is uh, is really well. That, that, that's a team that's comprised entirely of transfers because Abdurahim just got there, and their best player is a guy who followed him from Kennesaw State. So that's that's the culture in college basketball <laughs> yeah. these days. But yeah, definitely agree. A, a fantastic job he's done. And that team is deep, really legitimately. Yeah, they've beaten Florida State, Memphis, and they just blew out FAU. And uh, the other t uh, team to keep an eye on maybe uh, as far as the non-power teams is Appalachian State. Yep. I yes. think they could be a really good bracket buster team with five starters coming back. They beat Auburn. They've swept James Madison, another bubble team. So uh, those are just some teams, I think. Uh, I know it's early, but uh, it's never too early to start thinking about ways that you can impact uh, March Madness. Well, now Cash with them easily last night, Greg. Oh, all right. Days. There you go. We, we, and uh, yeah, at, uh, at Playbook Sports, we'll, we'll pat ourselves on the back. We're on a, a terrible soccer run for whatever reason, <laughs> but uh, went three for three on my college basketball packages in terms of being profitable last awesome. night. Awesome. I broke them up. I broke them up uh, the earlies, the 9 p.m.s, and then the, the late West Coast. Tony, you have to take what Greg says with a, a grain of salt about Appalachian State. Uh, he liked them in football That's as right. well. But the fact, the fact <laughs> of the matter is he lives in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, I do. A home right. of Appalachian State. So <laughs> yeah, he, I do. <laughs> a pretty yeah. good feel for that basketball team or that program, I should program, say, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm with you, Greg. I like that basketball team as well. 
Uh, before we sign off here, I'll share with you guys my complimentary play on the card this week. I'm going to go inside the Big 12 Conference here when Kansas State plays host to BYU on Saturday. We're talking about a BYU basketball team that beat Kansas State earlier on in the season this year. They had a really nice basketball season. They have the Cougars here. They're just one win shy of a 20-win season. They'll take 19 wins into that game on Saturday. They're sitting at 7-6 and six in the Big 12 Conference this year. But this is a basketball team that has a pure home-road dichotomy, unlike probably any other team in college basketball this year. You look at their work at home, they're 15-2 and two straight up and 12-5 and five to the spread. You put them on the road, they're only 2-5 and five straight up and 1-6 and six against the spread. Now they're going to take on Kansas State, looking with that big revenge chip on their shoulder from earlier this year. Kansas State goes home off a previous home loss that will get their attention. They'll come fully focused in a game like this. And you've got a Kansas State basketball team, guys, that last year, I believe they made it to the Elite Eight round of the NCAA tournament. And here they are right now going into Saturday's game, one game out of the cellar in the Big 12 Conference here. This team is 15-11, and 11, sitting on the bubble. They're another bubble team that we were talking about earlier on in the season here. And from our database, when this basketball team plays at home and they've got three or more days of rest, which they'll have coming into this game on Saturday, this team is 24 and seven. So they're in a lot of desirous roles here this week. They check a lot of boxes. I'm going to look for Kansas State to get out the schneid against BYU Saturday for my top complimentary play on the college basketball card this week. And that's going to put the final wraps on this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. I'm going to thank our co-host Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com. Tony Mejia joining us from Playbook Experts with an excellent insight. We're looking forward to visiting with Tony weekly throughout the basketball season moving forward as well. And for Victor King and Jim Feist, who are off AWOL and out for a little while here, wish them to, uh, well in recovery as well. For Greg De Palma, our producer, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always. <laughs>